Hey everybody, welcome marketers. Welcome to day two of the second ever Digital Marketing Europe Conference. My name is Larry, and as you know from before, I'm the co-founder of The Brains, a full-service digital agency in the UK. I'm also the host of my own YouTube channel called Brainy Marketing, and I'm very passionate about marketing education. And as such, it really is my distinct honor to be hosting the uh, conference for this year that focuses on the digital marketing industry and brings together world-class experts together to share their insights and experience with you all. What I love about the conference is the speaker and talk mix. Yesterday, I saw amazing insights and strategies for both people getting started with the basics all the way up to some really hyper-technical tactics that I've personally never seen before. So this year as well, I think after the pandemic, I think it's so relevant here for two years. They, we saw an insane growth of digital marketing um, during the pandemic. So loads of businesses were switching their marketing online because they had no choice. There was also an increased activity with people who were already running digital ads and, and doing digital marketing. And so I think that's a really big opportunity for all of us to kind of level up our game. And the second is just the growing complexity every year that seems to compound of tools, tactics and um, and uh, strategies. And so that's what we get at this conference. We get the brightest in the marketing community to all come together and learn these things that are going to make us much more effective. So everyone, we are definitely in the right place here today at the conference. I hope everyone who was here yesterday also got a lot of value. I know that I certainly did. And I've already forwarded multiple PDFs to the heads of different departments in my agency. And I suggest that you guys all do the same because the quality of information this year is definitely on another level. Um, it's also really cool that we're uh, streaming in more than 35 different countries. So for that, I'd like to thank all of you from, for tuning in from your different parts of the world to make this event so kind of colorful and diverse. Um, to make this virtual conference happen, we're actually using an advanced event platform called Pine. This is going to allow us to live stream these sessions, engage with us. Uh, with each other through live chat, check schedules, get to know all the speakers, as well as attendees of the conference. And what's more, you can also visit our sponsors at their virtual booth, who I'll introduce in a second. Of course, get help through the help desk if you get lost in the environment. Um, all the virtual event platform possibilities you can explore during the breaks, and we will have a special slide for you explaining the different platform functionalities. Um, this year, each track, um, as you know, will be led by um, experienced um, uh, track hosts, that's me, but also the other four brilliant track hosts that will be going today, who will do their best to make your conference experience as enjoyable as possible. Um, so let's do another shout out uh, today, just quickly for all of this year's amazing sponsors. So our platinum sponsor for this year is Amplitude, and they help companies understand how their customers use their products, use behavioral data to adapt experiences to every user, and measure results and overall digital business performance. The two gold sponsors are Tidio, a customer experience tool that helps micro and smaller businesses serve their clients efficiently. Their flagship product is a live chat app powered by chatbots, and it's actually used by over 510 million unique users monthly around the world. So if you're in the market for a chatbot, go and check out Tidio. And Traffic Guard is a company that helps businesses get um, clarity that they need to unlock the best advertising results by verifying the traffic and protecting um, budgets. So definitely check them out. Finally, our silver sponsor, TDA, is one of the leading authority sites for digital marketing and is trusted by decision makers around the world. They provide a trusted third-party space where you can showcase your services, client endorsements, and attract new clients. Uh, besides all of the, the sponsors, we also have a knowledge partner, and this is exciting for everyone here on the conference. They're called PACT, and they're actually going to award the most active digital marketing conference attendees with really great eBooks of their choice that is gonna help them further their education in marketing. So if you participate actively during the conference, you know, you do things like rating sessions, um, uh, adding messages, um, you're gonna, and, and Q and A, you're gonna win a lot of stuff from PACT. And so after the conference, the most active at attendees will be notified, selected, and they'll get their goodies. Um, one last thing for me, I would like enc to encourage everyone as ever to be as interactive as possible during the conference. Um, it's the time to come and focus and enjoy everything that uh, that is marketing and digital and the lineup this year is so amazing but i know that you guys already know that already um now what you've all been waiting for drum roll please it's time for me to introduce our opening keynote the maverick of marketing the boss of branding mr phil palin 
Phil is a branding expert. He's a social media expert and a regular speaker at some of the highest profile marketing events and conferences around the world. His talk on branding you're about to hear will introduce you to his unconventional methods and unique mind, one that has helped many large brands and prominent politicians and organizations such as the Nobel Peace Prize and Shark Tank succeed. You may also have seen Phil's contribution in media outlets around the world, including CNN, Access Hollywood, and the Daily Mail. So let's all focus up, finish off those coffees, and tune in for Phil Palin. Phil, the floor is yours. Thanks so much for being here. Larry, what an intro. Can I just pack you up and put you in my pocket every conference that I go to? I appreciate you. What an intro. We'll work, out a, um, we'll work something out. Yeah, we'll work that out. I love that you said for people to finish their coffee. I want them to think of me as their second dose of caffeine today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, new friends. So to be able to see my screen, I'm going to now go full screen with my slides. And I'm going to welcome you to day two of this incredible conference. Oh, my God. There's the content that we've seen in day one. And now day two, I am so inspired to be hanging out with you guys this morning. I feel especially excited that I get to open the day. It's my very favorite thing to do when I speak at conferences and share some actionable tips with all of you. I am a brand strategist. I've been at it for about 10 years. I help people and companies position, build, and promote their brands. I've been at it, as I said, 10 years, 305 clients in 32 countries. I love that. I think, Larry, you said 35 countries we are streaming in today. Um, that is amazing. I don't know where you in the are in the world, but I think what we should start with in the chat to wake us up a little bit is put in the chat of this session, this keynote, put in the chat where you are in the world. I know we've got some people that are joining us in person. We've got a lot of people that are joining us around the world. So go ahead, put it in the chat. I'm not going to be able to see it right now because I'm full screen with my slides, but you better believe I'm going to look at that as soon as we wrap up today and get into Q&A. But for everyone else to say, go ahead and put where you are, your current location in the world in the chat right now and we can see how diverse this amazing group is well i'm canadian i'm joining you from orlando florida at the moment i speak and travel a lot so orlando is where i am now recently i've been to places like cairo and poland and tokyo and london we were just chatting about that sao paulo brazil dubai helsinki I have the distinct privilege of traveling around the world, sometimes virtually like we are today in the middle of the night for me, morning for you, for some of you. And I get to share practical knowledge that's gonna help you build your brands. Now listen, my specialty is in personal branding. That's what my reputation is rooted in. It doesn't mean I don't work with companies and startups. I certainly do, but people tends to be my focus, okay? And so the strategies that I'm gonna teach you today, we're gonna to talk about digital marketing, we're gonna talk about branding, we're gonna talk about people and humans, but even in the context of companies and startups, we're gonna talk about the humanizing elements of those companies or organizations. I think you're gonna like this. I know we're just getting started on day two, so I've gone ahead and made notes for you a summary of everything I'll talk about over the next few minutes, then into Q&A, get your questions lined up because I'll make sure we have some time. In the Q&A, you can get as selfish as you want about what questions you wanna ask about positioning, building, and promoting your brands. My name is Phil Palin and you can get the notes philpallon.co slash notes. That's where I put them. You can get those notes that summarize what we're gonna talk about today. Okay, I'm breaking this down into it's around five actionable steps or tips or ways of looking at what it means to have a brand in 2022 and beyond. Let's actually start there, shall we? What does it mean to have a brand right now, today, whether you're a person or whether you're a company? Well, experts and thought leaders define this term in all different ways. Jeff Bezos has a great definition that I love. A brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. Let's all acknowledge right now the fact that conversations are happening when you're in the room, but guess what? They are likely happening, almost guaranteed to be happening when you're not in the room. And so branding, I love this definition because I think branding considers the effort 
the tools and resources we have available at our fingertips to have some control over the first impression that we give others online. Let's further discuss this. Cheryl Sandberg has an interesting and very different take on this. She says, when we're packaged, we're ineffective and inauthentic. I don't have a brand, but I do have a voice. Very interesting perspective. I think an important one to acknowledge. I think this term personal branding, which for the record is all I've ever done in 10 years. I've, yeah. Phil, so, sorry to interrupt you mid-flow, but we can't actually see your slides. You, will you toggle oh. them back on? I think uh, I think maybe there was just a glitch when you did it the first time. Yeah, hold on. Let me see if I can turn it. Camera. Here we go. You know what? There we go. Now can you see them? Perfect. Yes. Brilliant. Yay. So much. I'm glad you told me. Thank you for interrupting me. Oh my gosh, you got to see the visuals. So let's keep going. I talked a little bit about Jeff Bezos' definition. Thank you, Larry, for that. I appreciate that. Um, Cheryl Sandberg next no. has an interest has an interest on this. I already read it to you, but I think this idea of personal branding has really been tarnished in some way. Maybe it's by Instagram. <laughs> Maybe it's by this desire to, you know, create. I would, don't know if I'd call it an illusion, but this idea of perfection online or just the surface, right, of what is going on in our lives or what we want to show out there. So branding, what I believe at its core, is not something that is unlike what exists in real life online. So let me clarify that. I think the best online branding recreates the in-person experience as closely as possible. The best branding recreates the in-person experience as closely as possible. And so I, I think we're, I'm sure we'll talk about this. I know I've got a panel coming up with some social media experts in a few hours. I will take a nap before that. But we're gonna be talking about this really interesting direction that social media and digital marketing is heading right now, this kind of anti-aesthetic, this kind of move away from corporate social media, the rise, you know, I'm very interested in what young people have to, be, have to say about social media right now, where they're showing up. Um, it's not Instagram. Um, this idea that really we're just getting back to who we are, how we show up in real life and how we're achieving that same kind of consistency online. We'll continue to explore this concept together. Tim Ferriss has a totally different perspective on this that I want to share with you. He says a brand is about managing your name in a world of misinformation, disinformation, and semi-permanent Google records. This is the moment in time where I like to say branding is best done proactively, not reactively. I have clients of all different levels of fanciness and fame um, that will sometimes have projects where they want things removed on the internet. It's very hard to do if any of you have done that or had those been tasked with those projects. It's difficult. And I, and I like to think of building your brand, your personal brand, or even your company brand as a marathon, not a sprint. Okay, This is not something we're going to achieve completely by tomorrow, but if we can carve out 15, 20, 30 minutes a day or a week to chip away is the best way to describe this. We can proactively have some say, some control over how people experience us online. Because in 2022 and beyond, there are two versions of us. There's the in-person experience that I have to say, shout out to this conference and shout out to this amazing platform, Pine, because it almost feels like we're standing in a room together, right? Doesn't it? Where I listen to what you say, content, and more importantly, I would argue, I listen to how you say it, personality. And it's that second one that I tend to focus a little more on because it keeps people coming back to you for information. We can't sell people on content alone. Content paired with personality are those two, I almost think of it like a ratio. Uh, it's a sliding scale between those two elements. And we figure out where you are on that scale and we work towards becoming self-aware to create that online brand that 
recreates the in-person experience. I have so many examples for you in the minutes that we're going to spend together. So look forward to those. Let me give you one more definition that we're going to dive, dive into my definition. A brand is key to monetizing your passion online. Gary V. We all know him. Um, I just love this quote. I just love this quote because it reminds me that anyone, I don't care what your job is, I don't care how old you are, I don't care what country you're in, those things don't matter. What matters is that you realize and understand the opportunity that exists to create a brand around something you love to do, okay? But something you love is what I call a hobby. When we pair something you love to do with something others need and are willing to spend money on, that becomes the very powerful formula with just two variables uh, to successfully position your brand. Something you love paired with something others need and are willing to spend money on. Larry mentioned in the intro, uh, one of my longest projects. In fact, it is my longest project since I started. I've worked uh, on a little show here in the US called Shark Tank. Maybe you've heard of it. I work specifically for one of the sharks. Um, and it's been almost 10 years. And I have sat through every pitch of the show um, and watched it and come to realize it's never just the product or service that's being pitched, is it? It's always the human that's doing the pitching or the communicating, however you want to describe it, right? And so there is, regardless of how digital media and online marketing develops and evolves from this point forward, I can guarantee you I would put all the money I have on it that the one thing that will not change is the importance of the human element in how we communicate and how we show up. It's never going to change. It's never going to change. And so that's why my work is really distinctly focused on how do we achieve consistency between the in-person experience and the online version of you because we're juggling two versions. So let's talk about my, my definition of branding. I think your brand is a sandbox. We create the way that we communicate who we are, what we stand for, what we offer, distilled down so it's clear. And then we figure out what all of this looks like visually, right? You define the parameters of what it means to be on brand. And then we work towards achieving that consistency that I've been discussing, right? It's, I think it's cute when a company creates the most detailed set of brand guidelines, but really those don't matter. It's up to the company's employees to define that in-person experience. We could argue that it also is up to the customers or the clients, the people who use the product or service. We can also throw another humanizing element into that. Leadership, the founders, the people at the top, right? That founded the company that have an interesting story or motivation to create, right? We're mining here for opportunities of storytelling. And this is that timeless element that's never going to change. And it is so ingrained in what we're doing with personal branding. Like I say, technology is going to continue to evolve, but these are the things that will never change. So let's talk about some important questions that I want you asking yourself, okay? Because listen, branding, I love it. I love to make things look beautiful. I have lots of projects in this presentation and a few well, more than a few on my web, over 60 personal branding projects that might inspire you on my website. Um, but none of this matters unless we're clear on three, <clears throat> three questions. The first one is this, what is your business goal? So think about it. Let's, we've got the time. Let's take 30 seconds or let's take 15 seconds. And I want you to think about this right now. What is your business goal? The more specific, the better. Let your answer to that question influence your digital marketing or social media presence and strategy more than anything else. What is your business goal? 
my firm belief is that branding is the most powerful business tool that we have available to us because we can actually set some goals. We can manifest where it is we want to go in a year, five years from now. We can actually make that happen with branding. And I'll talk more about that. Second question I want to be thinking about, what makes you memorable? What makes you memorable? The way people experience you should strongly inspire how you show up online. So you want to aim to become self-aware so you can position your brand to highlight your strengths. Okay, If you're not sure what makes you memorable, don't be afraid to ask others. This could be as simple as posting on a social media platform like Facebook. Describe me in one word. Comment below. You know, or I think they'll know to comment oh, it's 2022. Describe me in one word. I would love for some of you to try this. If it's not in the middle of the night where you are, like it is for me, maybe try it tomorrow. But if it's not, if it's morning for you, go ahead, go on a social media platform and just test this for me. Okay. What you're going to notice is that people are going to describe you in a word if they followed the rules, but you're going to start to see common words show up as other people describe the experience of you, okay? And that's interesting. When we start to see trends or commonalities in the results that we get, we're noticing some trends or some similar descriptors on how people experience you. And I guarantee that's different than how you experience yourself, right? What makes you memorable? We need to be aware of that because you are inevitably part of the product or the service. You're part of that experience and we need to become self-aware. We all need to be you know, working towards becoming as self-aware as possible. What is it you're good at? What is it you're not good at, right? What are the strongest ways that you can communicate your message? For me, it is not writing. Honey, I cannot write a blog post. For the day is long, I but I can turn this camera on and I can have a microphone and I can sit here and chat and answer questions and inspire in this medium. And that's why I'm here doing it, right? It's an example of self-awareness. One more question I want you thinking about, and we're going to move on. What do people need? What do people need? Succeeding online or succeeding on social media means winning over the hearts, brains, and eyes of your potential audience. And I feel like when you really understand your audience, your pathway to success becomes clearer, okay? So that's why I asked this question, what do people need? Be wholeheartedly focused, wholeheartedly focused on what your audience needs so you can provide that to them. So, those are the three most important questions I'll ask you in this presentation. If you didn't jot them down, they're in the notes, linked in the bottom right. Let's keep going. Create parameters. Draw the lines in the sandbox. That's my definition of what it means to have a brand in 2022. Steps that have worked for me. Okay, I've worked in many, many different industries. Personal brands, company brands, startups, you name it. The process, regardless of industry or level of fanciness, the process that always works well for me. Position your brand, build something to show for it, and then stick a for sale sign out front of that house that you worked hard to position and stage, right? If you take a house to market that doesn't have a roof, you're only going to get a fraction of the value that you really deserve. So keep that in mind. Rebrand. Usually with a group this size, a question will come up in the Q&A. So I'm proactively answering it now. Phil, when is it time to rebrand? My answer is this. It's time to rebrand when your brand no longer serves you. You get to define what serving means. But here's an example. If your brand doesn't excite you, if you look at your logo or your colors or your typography, and you go, ugh, this isn't exciting. This feels old. Guess what? Left with old wrapping paper. And it might be time to update some of those visual elements so that it keeps you in the game, so that it keeps you excited. It's time to rebrand when your brand no longer serves you. I'm not going to attach a timeline on that. Some brands go a long, long time without ever updating their visual elements. And that includes photography. But 
Nowadays, I'd say it's more common to rebrand every few years, even if it's some of the softer elements. We can talk about that more in the Q&A. Branding is an art, but it's also a science. I aim today to give you tangible steps. Follow this step, this step, this step, this step, right? But there's also an artistic element to this. I'm not expecting you to be able to go and do everything. Sometimes you have to rely on some creative friends, maybe a graphic designer or photographer to pull off some of this. If you're not good at those things, then don't do them. There's a reason I can't be held responsible in a spreadsheet. That's not my area of expertise. So I delegate that and I have someone more trustworthy to handle those responsibilities. We talked about this already, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. We'll keep going, but companies can humanize in three ways. Leadership at the top, tell those stories. Uh, customers or clients, tell those stories. We see this a lot on platforms like Instagram, social media. It's very common to share stories, right? Um, almost every ad campaign is designed around how a customer experiences the product or service. And then my favorite group of the three, the side employees that honestly often get forgotten about or they are less prioritized compared to telling the leader story or telling the story of the customer or the client. Um, I think it's incredibly powerful to mobilize the people on the inside of your company to be advocates, brand advocates of what you're creating. Very powerful. It should not be underestimated. Finally, we'll talk about this. Build an inventory of conversations, thoughts, and ideas to pull from that recreate that in-person experience. So much of what I talk, talk about is achieving that consistency. So we're going to spend a few minutes talking about, and I'll give you some free tool recommendations to create that inventory. You're going to build that ability, train your brain to go, wait, that's a good idea for content. Oop, I should talk about that. Or oop, I should elaborate on that to tell a story because it's happening in real life and it should happen online too. Let's keep going. So we've defined branding. Let's talk about your brand as the you create. And we should talk about some ways to measure your impact or your success online. I'm going to keep this light and easy to digest. We're not getting uh, some of these sessions, by the way, this conference have been so beautifully, wonderfully in depth. I'm going to have to go back and watch them 10 times to absorb all of this advanced amazingness. My presentation should not be that, right? Remember, I'm your, your, your second dose of caffeine today. We'll, we'll talk about some of the most important things as it relates to branding and digital marketing, and then we'll move on. There are two ways to measure success or performance or impact of your experience. Quantitative measurements, obviously anything to do with numbers. So website traffic is a great metric that sometimes people forget to check. Here's a little tip. Create a calendar a reoccurring calendar reminder once a month to hop into your website analytics. If that's not something you do, do it. Inquiries, very important measure of whether people are interested in your product or service. So keep track of that as a number. We'll talk about qualitative in a second, which is also important. Uh, followers on social media, probably the least important in this short list of quantitative measurements, but still an indicator that you, you might be onto something, right? And then finally, sales, definitely the most important. At the end of the day, we got to keep these lights on because it is, in fact, the middle of the night. And the only way to do that is through sales. And so never, ever sway or never get distracted from what matters most. And it's easy online. It's easy with new tools and fancy, shiny objects and social media platforms. Sometimes we're so focused on creating a reel. Oop, it took us six hours. And now we could have spent that time actually building the business. Not to say you're real, can't build your business, it can, but priorities, priorities, <laughs> sales. Let's talk about qualitative. These are harder to measure. So things like and not limited to sentiment on social media, measure that or at least assign value to it. Are people happy every time they message you or engage with your brand or comment? Are they leaving positive feedback? That's a great metric, particularly if you've got product, service. There are ways to measure whether it's a positive experience. You're getting that feedback. Don't be afraid to ask for it. Oops, I clicked too fast, too fast. Hold on, let me get back to where I was. Too excited. Connection beyond transaction is the last one I want to talk about. Okay, really important reminder. How are you connecting with a customer, a client, a user in a way that's going to keep you as a brand top of mind. 
How are you connecting with them in a way that's going to keep them coming back for more? On my Instagram story today, which if we're not connected on Instagram, we should be. That's my go-to platform for being social, at Phil Palin. I posted on my Instagram story today a picture of my doormat. It doesn't sound exciting, does it? Well, I branded my doormat. And I took a picture. I tagged the company I bought it from. They told me today that they've had 10 sales from me putting it on their Instagram story. And they were really nice. I loved working with them. I loved it so much that I went back to them and ordered three more because I have a few other houses I'm working on. Connection beyond transaction. How can you create an experience that people go, oh my God, you're my person for, insert the blank, insert your brand. I want you to work towards connecting with your audience beyond a single transaction. Keep them coming back for more. Number three, let's keep going. So the more time, you know, faster I get through this, the more time we have for Q&A, and I can't wait to be a resource to you. Let's talk about a brand having heart, which sounds kind of corny, but it's not. Humans connect with other humans. And I think that's often forgotten about, or at least we get distracted when technology gets in the middle of you and your audience. So I am really interested in learning how to personify your brand in a powerful way online, okay? So I'm going to give you some tools that I think they're free, which is awesome, even better. I'm going to give you some tools that I think you're going to really like that are going to help you create that inventory that we've started to talk about. You may know some of these, but I'll show you very specifically how I use them. I'm going to grab my phone. So the first one is otter.ai. This is a very simple transcription tool. Um, what I love about the idea of transcribing is to get ideas from here somewhere that I can actually execute on them. I love the David Allen quote, David Allen from Getting Things Done, very famous book on productivity. He says, your brain is for generating ideas, not for storing them. Do not store your ideas up here. This is for generating them. Get them down somewhere where you can actually execute on them. Sometimes we overcomplicate tweets. Instagram captions. Yes, I feel like we should write an email blast right now. Don't you think so? I think we can do it in less than a minute. So I'm going to do it right in front of you. I'm going to write an email blast. And then I want you to think about how you can do this, starting with a simple question or a simple thought, something you've been thinking about. Okay. So we're going to open otter.ai. So here, it's crazy to think that thought leadership was once accessible, only accessible by society's elite. The politicians running your city or country, journalists and news anchors bringing you information in various mediums every day. Cut to now. Your job could be selling insurance. You still need to be comfortable communicating on camera, sharing your ideas in written form and understanding your audience so that you can help satisfy a need like every good business does. Okay, so... We just wrote an email blast. And I guess I'm pretty sure that was less than a minute. Get idea from here. Your idea is not for, your brain is not for storing ideas. It's for generating them. Get it in your inbox. Get it on your to-do list. Get it somewhere, but out of your brain so that you can take action on it. Do not overcomplicate this stuff. That is a great with some, you know, bare bones editing, a great email blast that could lead into, you know, all kinds of other things. Don't overcomplicate it. Let's talk about where to store all of your crazy ideas. I have two favorite places to store ideas. My favorite is Dropmark, which is free for their uh, free plan. And then I think it's $5 to upgrade to their premium. It's not a lot of money. It's the equivalent of a latte. Dropmark is, um, think of it like post-it notes where you keep all of your ideas basically in various forms. I'll actually show you. This is my drop mark. So I organize it by category of things that I talk about. Inspiration, positioning, identity photos. And I can show you, I'll click on one of these. You can see anytime I see an ad or anytime I see a resource, typography, anything I, I see and go, ooh, this is cool. I might want to come back to this for some reason. I put it in drop mark, which is basically my version of sticky notes everywhere, but they're all in one place. The biggest mistake we can make 
is putting all of our ideas everywhere. Notes on our phone, in our inbox, in Evernote, in Dropmark, sticky notes. Just imagine, right? You, you, you have to consolidate your ideas in one place so that it improves the likelihood that you actually execute or take action on them. I feel strongly about that. So Dropmark is cool. Evernote is cool. I think Evernote is, there's also a fee associated with Evernote after a certain point of usage. Those are great tools and well worth the investment. But they're free to start, so try them out. The last one you might be familiar with, it's just my favorite tool for visualizing content ideas. Even if you know it, let's talk about how I use it and I might give you some ideas. So for the public is based in the UK. It is such an amazing tool for essentially visualizing what people are looking for, what people are typing into Google. So let's see it in work. I go to this website. There's a limited number of searches for free, so use them wisely. Personal branding, search. And after literally a few seconds, um, it'll show you a visualization of actual queries, questions that people are looking for on this topic. So now you will never be out of content ideas, okay? Ever. They even structure it as questions and as prepositions. And you'll spot here in seconds some ideas where you go, oh my God, why didn't I think of that? That's such a good topic for a YouTube video. That's such a good way to approach an Instagram carousel where I'm going to teach people how to do something, right? Free, I think one search a day. Um, they've got a premium plan, but you probably don't need it uh, unless you're a company and you see, you know, you can afford the subscription and you might want to use this tool more. I love it to pop in there once in a while and get some fresh ideas for content. Okay. So we talked about a brand having heart. We talked about tools that will help us humanize. We're going to keep going and we're going to talk about photos. I warned you, I said today would be a little different than the typical digital marketing presentation that you'll, that you'll consume today. There's going to be so many good ones throughout the day on day two. Um, I talk about branding and I talk about things that honestly I've talked about for years and only slight changes because this stuff is timeless. Photos. When someone says to me, Phil, I have a limited amount of time or money. What do I invest in online? I would not say go and get a logo. I'd say put your brand name in a good font for now. And when you hit a certain milestone in business, then hire someone like me to design your logo beautifully. <gasps> but until then, don't do it. Don't do it. What you do need to do is have great photos online. If you resort to just using stock photos, if you resort to using photos that are 10 years old and pixelated, that is like showing up to a wedding in pajamas. It's not even, it's inappropriate. I don't know how it's, it, it's inappropriate. In 2022, it is digitally irresponsible to not put some effort into how you show up online for something as simple as a profile photo. So I like to push the envelope. I'm not a big fan of boring headshots. Um, I like to see people in their environment. I like to see them at work. I like to look at a photo and get a flavor of what they're all about, okay? Not saying I know some people need headshots and we can't get too crazy. I get it. I'm going to show you a whole range today. I'm not even going to tell you anything about these clients because if I if I've done my job correctly or successfully as a brand strategist, you should be able to look at these photos and really get a sense of who they are and what they're all about. Okay. So the best photos I always say are spontaneous. We can't overplan them. They're just going to happen. Get a good photographer. Pick out some outfits that make you feel like a rock star. Return them the next day. If you can't afford them, that's fine. Uh, that's very common here in the U.S. I don't know if you can pull that off in Europe. Uh, and then the best shoots are planned. So I've got a really good on my website, philpallon.co slash freebies. I have a free um, photo shoot planning uh, one page Google uh, template that you might want to check out if you're planning a photo shoot in the next few months. That's a very helpful tool. Best photos are spontaneous. The photos that I choose for my clients are the ones that they think are going to be bloopers. Are they going to be ones that get cut out laughing or looking to the side, just totally being themselves and being vulnerable in the moment? Those are the ones I use. You'll see. And the best shoots are plans. So you want to put some effort into what, you know, what does a successful outcome look like after this photo shoot? I'll have photos for 
social. I have photos for my about page. I'll have photos for blog post thumbnails, et cetera. Okay. Now let's look at some visuals because that's the fun part. Again, not telling you anything about my clients, but if I've done my job, you should be able to get a sense of who they are, what they do, and what they're all about. This photo was really fun to make. Obviously, no one has that many hair rollers, curlers, I think you call them, not rollers or curlers, whatever those are called. So we put them all on one side for one photo, and then we said, okay, stay still. And then we put them all on the other side, and of course, we Photoshop them in post, so it looks like double the amount. By the way, not every brand needs to be humorous or loud. Sometimes we can capture thoughtfulness quieter moments. Sometimes photos can be so good that they inspire the rest of the palette or the rest of the brand, which is exactly what happened in this case. This single photo that we love so much inspired the palette that we use for the entire brand. Photos always come first. They're always more important because they can inspire everything else. If you're curious about any of these people, almost all of them are on my website as a portfolio project. I love to see people in their environment doing what they do, right? We, we have to communicate something more on the internet nowadays. So I want to make sure we have time for Q&A. I always love to have at least 10, 15 minutes for Q&A. So that's what I'm, I'm checking the clock up here. That's what I'm, I'm aiming for, okay? I really do. I love to answer questions and I love to look at things and give you ideas. So let me round off this presentation with one last little lesson or thought. And I think you're ready for it. I think you're ready for an advanced little lesson here on branding, something that I incorporate into all of my projects, this idea of sub branding. What does it mean to have a sub brand? Well, a big part of branding or personal branding is just organizing. My clients, it's like this, they, they come to me with a purse and they just, we have to dump everything out and then we have to look at what we have and we have to go, okay, let's put this into some kind of order. Ooh, this is important. This matters. This needs to go up here. This is less important. It might feel important, but it's actually not that important. Let's put it over here until we, we finish this, right? And it's just organizing in that way. And so sub-branding is this idea of not just branding the name of your company, creating a logo and calling it a day, that's not enough. But sub-branding is this idea of taking it one step further and creating a visual presence or a visual identity for a system or a process or a way that you do something, a memorable, it can be any kind of memorable experience that you give. And if we can create a visual for that, it's going to help people remember you and it's going to help you stay top of mind, one of the goals that we've been talking about. Now, that's a lot of talking. Let me give you some examples, right? So this is Rachel, a client of mine who's a nutritionist. She came to me and said, Phil, I work with clients in three ways. I work with them as, you know, in consulting or in communications or as a spokesperson. But I really, I want to do more work in advocacy and in education. And I said, okay, great. We have, in branding, we have the ability to manifest that. So let's create a visual presence for all of the access points. So in this case, we sub-branded Rachel's points of access, the ways in which clients can access her, what that looks like. Right. And so on her services page, you'll see a combination of these five, uh, these five points of access, I would call them. Now let's look at another example. Simon T. Bailey is a keynote speaker, a motivational speaker. I work with a lot of speakers. And he came to me and said, Phil, you know, I want to be speaking at this caliber of conferences. And rather than just emailing them and saying, Hey, I'd love to speak at your conference, I'd love to go to them with, you know, any one of my custom keynotes that are normally in these core six areas. So we created a visual icon, like a, a little icon system, a set um, for each of these little animated icons to represent one of his keynotes. 
Rick is a client of mine in Stockholm, Sweden. That's closer to you than it is to me right now. And Rick is an analytical advisor and has a really unique way of growing his audience, which is podcasting, having multiple podcasts. And before he came to me, he had different artwork and different, um, all different, you know, fonts and colors and nothing was organized. And I said, okay, Rick Lindbergh, you, the personal brand, that's the brand. And then we've got, you know, podcasts, which are essentially almost like social media channels for him. They're his ways of cultivating and growing his audience. And we created a visual system so that they could live together like little unique, but also related siblings. Okay. And that's what you're seeing on the screen, all of his different podcasts. So those are a few examples of subbranding. I have many, many more on my website. Um, many, many more on my website. I feel like we should pause now for questions. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes. Um, if we want to talk about social media, we can. I can talk about YouTube, but let's take some questions now. That's brilliant. Thanks so much for that, uh, Phil. It was it was definitely eye opening, and um, thanks for that second dose of coffee. Definitely seemed to have worked because you've got uh, a lot of questions to get through. So I think your Excellent. your call to do. move to Q and A was a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, Great. So I'm just going to crack on if that's all right with you, and and Please. give you some of them. Yeah. So um, Arturus uh, Tilindis asks um, one question that I was thinking as well is what what are the biggest or most common branding mistakes that people or companies make that stand out to you? So which ones really trigger you when you see them? I know you've talked about the photos. That's a, a big trigger point. But is there anything else that are just big no-nos that brands or people make? Yes. The biggest no-no which is even bigger than resorting to stock photos 100% of the time or using photos that are not high quality. Um, the bigger one is when brands jump too quickly to promote something that hasn't been properly positioned or built. So much of my work is going back to those first two phases. To the point where I won't even take, like, if, if someone says to me, Phil, I've got a book launch coming up in a month. Um, can you help me blow this thing up online? Honestly, I probably can. But in order to sell the house, the house needs a roof. So if we take this house to market without a roof, you're going to get a fraction of the value that you really deserve. And so, so much of my work is going back and saying, okay, I, let's talk about how this is positioned. Let's be super clear on who your audience is. Let's be super clear brands out there we can learn from visually. How do we have some kind of consistency around here? Could it be better, et cetera? So, so the mistake, the, the most, the most common mistake, and I'd say the biggest mistake that I see is when brands jump too quickly to want a sticker for sale sign out front of a house that is not positioned to bring the most value. Brilliant. Thanks. Hope that answered your question, Arturis. Um, and uh, so another question from Santa um, Dunaiska says, what could you recommend for an old brand to stay with its identity, but shake up the market and strengthen its brand? Mm, okay. Interesting, so right? I love that question. Yeah. yeah, I love that question. Yeah. So two things come to mind. Um, by the way, whenever I answer questions like this, I try to be very specific and actionable. I'm not a... Um, I'm not a futurist. I don't live in the world of possibilities. I live in the now. So there's two things I would do, and I'm going to tell you what I would do so you can go and do them. I would get some, so first thing I would do, get together the decision makers or the, the stakeholders, whatever we want to call them, or the, honestly, the people you trust to weigh in on revisiting the positioning of the brand. Okay. Don't let ego get in the way. There's no, I don't care. The biggest company in the world, the most successful company in the world should still be at least once, twice a year, routinely revisiting how are we positioned in the marketplace? And is there something even small that we could tweak that would improve that positioning? Okay. Um, actually, I'm have some, I don't have them in my presentation, but I have some questions handy. Why don't I run through really quick since we've got time some of those really important questions that you could be asking yourself? 
um, that I would ask a brand um, in the positioning phase. So I told you, I like to give you specifics. So we already did this business goal. What makes your brand memorable? What do people need? Let me give you, let me give you a few more. Describe yourself in three words. Answer that and then get input from others. The input's more important than what you describe it. Name three things I wouldn't know just from looking at you. And these don't have to be embarrassing stories. Actually, quite the opposite. They could be, you know, I, I think of these as like little sparkles that make you, you. So for a personal brand, it could be something from your childhood. Um, maybe you've got a secret affinity for extreme sports. You know, get get down some creative ideas. And those are things that I would put on in an about page or in a social media bio. They're things that people remember. Three things I wouldn't know just by looking at you. Name a few brands that you look up to. Um, that's really important because nowadays everything is online. Not just your competitors, but also like brands, people that, um, you know, might do something similar to you, but halfway across the world. So they're not a competitor. I call those like brands. And then brand heroes, people that are a few steps above you, maybe they got to start a little bit earlier. Maybe they've had a vehicle, a platform like television to grow their audience faster. All of that's online. We can see, are people on Pinterest? How often are they pinning? Are people still blogging? Are they using keywords? How long are people writing their Instagram captions? How often are they posting? Which verticals of Instagram are they most active on, et cetera. So uh, how can you sum up a brand in one sentence? How can you sum up your brand in one sentence? Uh, those are a few questions that I would ask in the positioning phase. So that was step number one. Ask those questions and have a dialogue around how can the brand be better positioned. Second thing, update softer elements. You don't have to go and change the logo if it's printed in a million places because that's going to be expensive. Unless the logo is outdated and it's not serving you, remember? But an easier way to make updates and keep things fresh and exciting is to update color, typography. Those are the two uh, elements that, are, that can be softer, that are easier to update and easier to transition if there's a period there where you have to go from old to new. Hopefully that answers your question. Great, thanks, Phil. Um, an another question then was, um, this is um, uh, with your kind of client hat, client approaching, hat um someone said um i think it was helena uh Grahovac. sorry if i get your name wrong everyone You're but how to approach a client yeah i'm terrible but how to approach a client that desperately needs rebranding but isn't truly open for any changes or making effort and i and i actually you know i've, I've got a uh a, a long-term friend of mine who's a, a branding consultant and um you know i think sometimes it's hard unless the person has understood um, the value of a of brand themselves, they've internalized that. I've, I've often found it's hard to convince someone of the discrete value of a, of a brand, but then I'll, I'll say things like, and I don't know if you, you, you share this, but I'll say things like, you know, look at Tesla's market market um, cap as a, as an electric uh, car maker. Um, and it's market cap is that of all other car companies put together. And, you know, does like 1% of the sales in terms of, of cars. And so, yes, there's a, there's a, there's a technology piece there, but you have to account for quite a lot of that market cap as being the way that Elon Musk specifically personally and his company has branded themselves and has positioned yes. themselves uh, relative to other people. And so I always like to use that as an example of like that difference. That's the value of a proper brand and which can be in the billions, you know? So, but do you have any other ways that you can, any other, techniques like that that you use to not necessarily convince someone but to you know someone who's open to it or you know to to, to give them a, a way of understanding the value yeah i like the example you gave i also for the record think you're doing a great job with name pronunciations um I don't have a super satisfying answer to this question because I'm not going to put a lot of energy and time into convincing someone of what they need if they don't believe they need it. That's not my customer or my client. Um, it can be someone else's. My most frustrating projects, honestly, have been big corporate type projects that now I tend to avoid because we've spent six months doing an exercise and spent a lot of time and a lot of their money 
to at the end of six months to a year, end up with something that is extremely similar to what we started with, it drives me mental. So I'm not the person to ask this question to, because when a client comes to me, they have to believe and they have to want some change or be open and more importantly, trusting of the process. I will not take on a client who doesn't trust me when I make a recommendation. And by the way, it's not me just handing down a recommendation or a strategy and saying, here's what we're doing. It's a conversation. And so for me, if I don't sense that a client is trusting of me and open and at least positive or excited about what we're doing, it's just not going to end well. My best projects that I put on slides, that I talk about, that I brag about, that I'm so proud of, all of them, the common thread is that um, they trusted me. They trusted me through the process. It doesn't mean, it, sometimes it becomes therapy and that's totally fine. We create space for that. It's all part yeah. of it, but I don't take those people on. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think an, another that. way of saying what you're saying is almost <laughs> if someone's not there yet, it means that they're too, they're not even on the funnel. So, you know, the best right. solution might just be to send them a book or send them a, a YouTube playlist on the value of branding and let them figure it out and come back to you when they, they get it. Yeah. Yes. Hmm. Okay, great. Thank, thanks, Phil. Um, another question that I actually skipped over, sorry, but um, here is, yeah, it's about brand colors. Um, so when you were talking about it before, um, uh, Simona was asking, do I have to create um, the same mood color palette in all media channels? So Instagram, Facebook, website, if their brand book is with, let's say, red, black, and white color elements, do they have to use the same color elements in all channels? And how about if they choose to make the business Instagram like more red, Facebook more black, and the website more white? Um, what's your opinion on, on all of that? Hmm. That's a good question. We have about four minutes left, so I'm actually going to open up something different on my computer. Oh, look, I can see you. Um, I'm going to answer this question in uh, with an example. I'm actually just going to open my own brand board and show you <clears throat> show you how I would tackle this. So I don't think it needs to be z same z on everything. I think that gets boring fast. Your audience is going to get bored and you're going to get bored creating brand elements that are just the same logo, the same color. Um, I opened the Photoshop file. So it's just taking a second here. But what I do is I normally choose no more than five colors for a brand. Okay, so a, a white or a, or a version of a white and then a, and a black or a version of a black. I don't usually do pure black, but I'll do like charcoal. And then I fill in fill in about three more maximum, um, some colors that will give some life to the brand. Now, let me go ahead and share my screen. Did not plan on doing this, but you know, I like to live life on the edge here. So this is this is my brand board. I just, okay. So, so you can have this as a PDF, as a guidelines. Notice I have more than one logo because one logo would get really boring really fast. Some of these are for specific projects, but right, I'm going to have a different logo on letterhead that I'm going to have in an email signature that I'm going to have in a sign in behind my desk. I've even got this one tattooed on my wrist. If you look at my camera, I know it's a little extra, um, but that's me. So, okay. Color. Try to stick around five, fine if it's a little more, a little less, but um, this is what I wanted to show you to answer this question. You don't just need one color. I typically have one color as my main and then three variations of that to give you some range. You want range with your brand colors. So at least, I, I, I say four or five variations, could be lighter tones of that, that bolder brand color, and that's gonna give you the kind of range that you want. So I have a little more here than five because I've this one is used for a specific program or course. Um, but you get the idea. We you, branding really when you create this system is just about making, you know, um, making decisions and then making some rules and then following those rules. So even though I've looked at this um a thousand times, I open it still every day and I look at it and go, oh, I can get some ideas for my presentation for digital media Europe digital marketing Europe, right? Like there's, so branding, when you create a system, it's about creating rules. And then it's your job to follow those rules so that you work towards achieving that consistency or that familiarity where people are going to look at your post or the people are going to look at your, your 
asset and go, oh, that's Phil. I know that's Phil. That's what that's what you want. Hopefully that gives you some specifics and some visuals. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Phil. Well, I think we, we're going to wrap it up there. Thanks so much for um, for sharing all of your, your insights with us. And I think um, what you said before about however technology develops and a lot of the tracks that we're going to go on later, uh, people at the conference, do get into some very technical things. I love what you said that regardless of what happens with that technology, the core branding, messaging, how you position yourself will always be um, uh, done in, in, in this way. So yeah, it's great that we got to start the conference day two with this to kind of put ourselves on some firm foundations before we, we go, we go out. So thanks again so much. Phil. I love it. I will see you guys yeah. later on the panel about social media. And I appreciate all of you starting your day with me. We're going to have an amazing day too. Yeah. And make sure to follow um, Phil on all, all his uh, channels and you can download his, um, his PDF um, also in, in Pine, and you can message him in Pine if you have any specific questions. All right, everyone, That'd take care good. and see you for the next sessions. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, there's a very weird countdown where you're like, what do I do? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Great. Here we go. And <laughs> there we go. Everyone's.